Was this the worst engine ever strapped into a military aircraft? The Rolls-Royce Vulture was such a mechanical nightmare that planes literally fell out of the sky because of it. Designed to be a powerhouse, it ended up being an embarrassment. Pilots feared it. Engineers hated it. Even Rolls-Royce gave up on it during the middle of World War II. Why would anyone keep flying something this unreliable? Stick around till the end, because the truth behind the Vulture's failure is bigger than just bad engineering. Born from panic, not precision. In the 1930s, the world was charging headfirst into war. The British Royal Air Force needed more power, quickly. Their prized Merlin engine was already proving itself in fighter planes like the Spitfire, but when it came to heavy bombers, it wasn't enough. What the RAF really needed was a new generation of high-powered engines that could lift heavy payloads, go long distances, and take a beating in combat. So Rolls-Royce was told to build something stronger. But instead of starting from scratch, someone had the bright idea. Why not just combine two Merlin engines into a single high-power unit? Mash them together into an X shape, bolt on four banks of cylinders, and call it a day. Thus, the Rolls-Royce Vulture was born. It was supposed to pump out 1,800 horsepower. On paper, that made it one of the most powerful aircraft engines Britain had ever designed. But here's the problem. You can't cheat physics. You can't Frankenstein your way into a perfect machine. The Vulture was essentially four six-cylinder banks fused into one block, built around a common crankshaft. That crankshaft, by the way, was a weak point from the start. Add in poor cooling, increased friction, and oil circulation issues, and you had an engine that was barely holding itself together. Still, the Air Ministry didn't care. They needed an engine, any engine, that could lift a heavy bomber, so they pushed the Vulture into service anyway, long before it was ready. The Manchester, a bomber that was doomed from day one. The first aircraft built around the Vulture was the Avro Manchester, a twin-engine heavy bomber designed to match or exceed the capabilities of German bombers. It looked good on the drawing board. Two massive vultures, a sleek frame, and space for tons of bombs. This was going to be Britain's answer to the Luftwaffe, but the Manchester never stood a chance. The engines were its Achilles heel. Pilots started noticing problems on the very first flights. Overheating, random shutdowns, oil pressure dropping mid-mission. On more than one occasion, both engines failed, simultaneously. If a vulture failed over friendly territory, maybe you limped back to base. If it happened over enemy lines, you were a sitting duck. The statistics were horrifying. Manchesters were crashing without a single bullet fired at them. Crews died because of pure mechanical failure. And yet, the RAF kept flying them. Why? Because there was nothing else. The vulture had been chosen. The Manchester had been designed around it, and building a new engine-airframe combo would take years the RAF didn't have. To make matters worse, the aircraft's performance was underwhelming even when the engines did work. It was slow. It couldn't climb well. It had a limited range. It could barely carry the bomb loads that were expected of it, and all of that was on a good day. It got so bad that some squadrons were quietly grounded. Pilots refused to fly them. Mechanics dreaded working on them. Engineers were pulling their hair out, trying to patch up a fundamentally broken design. A rolling catastrophe that no one could stop behind the scenes. Rolls-Royce knew the Vulture was in trouble, but they were stretched thin. They were already pouring massive resources into the Merlin, which was becoming the backbone of Britain's air defense. Every hour spent fixing the Vulture was an hour not spent improving Spitfires or Hurricanes, and as the Battle of Britain loomed, priorities became crystal clear. The Vulture, meanwhile, just wouldn't behave. Engineers tried everything, changing cylinder heads, modifying oil lines, redesigning the crankshaft, but none of it stuck. The engine kept breaking. Worse yet, because it was in active service, each failure cost real lives. And remember, this was all happening during wartime. Britain was under attack. Every factory, every engineer, every drop of fuel mattered. Rolls-Royce was under pressure to deliver miracles on a tight budget and even tighter timelines. So they did what they had to do. They quietly stopped pushing the Vulture. The final straw came in 1941, when a decision was made to cease all development. The Vulture was officially dead. Rolls-Royce cut its losses. And just like that, 
one of the biggest engine flops in British aviation history was buried. Collateral damage. What happened to the planes that needed it? Killing the Vulture created a new crisis. The Manchester bomber, already limping along with a flawed design, now had no engine. Entire production lines were frozen. Squadrons were left in limbo. Britain's heavy bomber strategy was falling apart. But this disaster actually led to something brilliant. Avro, the company that built the Manchester, went back to the drawing board. They stretched the airframe. They added a third engine and then a fourth, but this time Merlin's. The result was the Avro Lancaster, one of the greatest bombers of World War II. Ironically, the death of the Vulture saved the British bomber program. By forcing engineers to abandon a bad engine, they were finally free to innovate without being chained to a failed design. The Lancaster went on to fly over 150,000 missions. It dropped more bombs than any other British plane, and it did it all with the very engine that the Vulture tried to replace. So in a twisted way, the Vulture's failure might have been the best thing that ever happened to British aviation. Why it failed? Engineering, ego, and war. So why did the Vulture fail so badly? It wasn't just bad luck or a couple of technical bugs. It was a combination of rushed design, poor testing, and unrealistic expectations. But more than that, it was ego. Rolls-Royce thought it could shortcut a powerful engine into existence by slapping together parts from a proven design. But when you start pushing mechanical boundaries, past success doesn't guarantee future results. The government didn't help either. The air ministry was desperate. They wanted results yesterday. Corners were cut. Tests were skipped. Engineers were told to just make it work. And that's not how good machines get built, especially not machines that carry people's lives into combat. There's also the simple fact that sometimes technology just doesn't scale. The Merlin worked because it was balanced, efficient, and well-tested. The Vulture took that balance and shattered it with a hammer. Could it have been saved or was it always doomed? This is the big question. If World War II hadn't been breathing down everyone's neck, if Rolls-Royce had been given the luxury of time, could the Vulture have actually worked? Could this engine, now remembered as a flying catastrophe, have been refined into something dependable, even revolutionary? Some historians argue that the answer is yes. The core concept of the Vulture wasn't entirely flawed. An X-24 engine layout, essentially four banks of six cylinders arranged in an X around a single crankshaft, was bold but not unprecedented. In theory, it allowed for compact design and high power output without massively increasing the size of the engine. Other countries, including the United States and Germany, experimented with similar concepts. With better materials, improved manufacturing processes, and the benefit of years of testing, the Vulture might have matured into a world-class engine. Key issues like the crankshaft failures, excessive heat, and oil circulation weren't necessarily unsolvable. They were just unsolved at the time. Britain's wartime metallurgy was still catching up to the demands of high-performance aviation engines. The alloy technologies needed to withstand the Vulture's internal stresses simply weren't available, or were being reserved for more urgent priorities like the Merlin. And let's not forget, Rolls-Royce was juggling multiple high-priority projects. The company was stretched thin, but the cold reality was this. Rolls-Royce didn't have five years, it had months. The war was accelerating. Bombers were needed yesterday, not next decade. Every Vulture that failed wasn't just a broken machine, it was a risk to crew lives and mission success. The Royal Air Force couldn't afford potential. It needed reliability right now. And right now meant cutting their losses, killing the Vulture, and putting everything behind the engines that were already winning the war. In the end, the Vulture's potential never got its chance. The legacy of a giant flop today, very few people remember the Rolls-Royce Vulture. There are no air shows honoring it, no restorations, no fan clubs. The engine is more myth than machine, famous only because of how bad it was. But its story is important because it shows how even the smartest engineers at the best companies can make catastrophic mistakes when under pressure. It shows what happens when you prioritize speed over safety, scale over sanity. And maybe most interesting of all, it shows that sometimes failure is exactly what leads to success. If the Vulture hadn't crashed and burned, 
there's a good chance the Lancaster never would have been built. And without the Lancaster, the outcome of the war would have looked very, very different. So next time you see a Lancaster flying overhead in a war documentary, remember? It took the worst engine Britain ever built to make one of the best bombers it ever flew. The Rolls-Royce Vulture was a mechanical monster born out of desperation. It was supposed to be a hero. Instead, it became a cautionary tale. But in that failure lies one of the greatest what-ifs of aviation history. What if it had worked? What if the Manchester had lived up to its promise? Or did it all happen exactly the way it needed to? If you enjoyed this deep dive into the biggest engine disaster you've probably never heard of, hit that like button, subscribe for more insane stories from history's mechanical graveyard, and tell us in the comments, what's the worst piece of military tech you've ever heard of? Thanks for watching.